Hopefully you have watched the video from Crash Course before picking up with this one. Now, I know that he talks pretty fast in that video, and I just want to review a little bit about what he talked about as far as how neurons work with that action potential. Um, I like that video, though, because he does have a lot of cool animations that I don't have access to. So all I've got are my pictures here in my PowerPoint. So one of the things that he talked about was how you've got that change in positive and negative. So you've got positive charges out here because you've got sodium in high concentration outside of the neuron. Um, and on the inside, you have a negative charge because you do have potassium. So you can see the potassium down here. It's hanging out. But comparatively, you have a lot more things that are negatively charged, like proteins and so forth. So you've got positive charge on the outside, negative charge on the inside. And as we found out in an earlier video, things like to move from high concentration to low concentration. Uh, same thing for charge. There's lots of positive charges out here. They want to move towards the negative charges. So these positive charges want to move in. They can't because the membrane is uh, a barrier that they can't cross. So they're going to need proteins. They're going to need facilitated diffusion. Um, so he showed you the different kinds of channels that can happen. So you saw the gated channel for sodium, the one that had like the little pull cord, uh, mechanical channels, the ones that um, pull open when the membrane moves, and then potassium channels, which, uh, open up when triggered as well, um, either by a change in membrane potential or by um, materials attaching to them. So we're going to start up here. We have a membrane or a axon at rest. So it has a, the resting membrane potential, which as he stated in the video, is at about negative 70 uh, millivolts. So it's just hanging out. We've got that positive and negative charge. Something trips inside of that neuron to start sending the signal. And so that triggers that first sodium channel to open. And it's going to uh, allow those sodium ions to flow in because we've got now, boom, that action potential, that change in the charge, because those sodiums have come in, we go from that negative 70, you hit the threshold at negative 55, and then all of these gates right in this area open, shoots that action potential up to 40, and they just start flooding in and change this into a positive charge. So we've got positive now instead of negative, and that's what's going to send the signal. Eventually, that action potential drops back off because those gated channels for the sodium get closed, but the potassium channels get open. So the potassium flows out to try and restore that balance, and eventually it will restore the balance of positive and negative in the axon. So how does this get passed down the neuron? And as you saw in the video, he showed you there towards the end. So we start with those gated channels at the beginning opening up, but not all of the gates along the axon open as soon as you hit the action potential. It's only in that one little area. But that going off and flooding that area with that change in charge is enough to kick the action potential in the section right next to it. And so that will open those gates and then it goes down the next section, opens those gates and so on and so on and so on. And then behind it, as you can see, those areas start to reset because those potassium channels are opening up and balancing the charge back out along with that sodium potassium pump that he talked about in the video.
So that's how we get those signals going down the axon to send information. As he mentioned, they, it's, it's just an on or off type signal. There's no uh, change in how big the signal gets. Um, it's how fast the signal is sent. And so the faster the signal is sent, that tells you, to, for example, he was talking about muscles, the faster the signal is sent, the more pressure or power you need to put in the faster the signal is sent for something like a pain receptor, the more pain your brain is going to register. And so if the signal is fairly slow, it's not going to register as a very you know, painful uh, response. And you also mentioned in the video the myelin sheath. So you can see that here in this picture. Got the myelin sheath along the axon. This is actually made up of special glial cells. So you can actually see that over here in the picture. So you've got the axon surrounded by those glial cells. And you've got the gaps in the myelin sheath, as he was talking about. And this is how organisms like ourselves get around the signal taking long, a long time to get down the axon. Now, when we say take a long time, we're talking about milliseconds, but we want those signals to travel as fast as possible. There are two ways to do that. One, make the axon bigger, right? Make the pipe bigger, the signal can go faster. But those big nerves, those big axons take up space. And so instead, organisms like ourselves have gone with myelated, uh, axons, myelated nerve cells, and so the signal can jump like you saw in the video. And so it doesn't have to travel the entire axon. It only has to, it, it hits here, and then the signal gets transferred to the next um, gap, and so on and so on down the axon until it gets to the end. So let's take a look. He said, you know, in the next video, we'll talk about what happens when we get to the end. Actually, I'm going to talk about it. If you want, you can go out and find his video, um, but we're going to talk about how these guys are actually communicating with each other. So action potentials are talking about how the signal travels within a single neuron. Now we're going to look at how neurons communicate with each other. So at the end of an axon, a neuron is going to connect with one or more target cells. So that um, terminal end on the axon where it branches off, it can connect to just another nerve cell, or it can connect to multiple nerve cells, or it can connect to cells like in an organ, like a heart, um, you know, your liver, wherever that nerve is headed to. So like, um, like I just said, it can be either another neuron, so it can be connected to another neuron or an interneuron to travel somewhere, or it's a cell that does something. So it's a cell that's doing an action. Um, so another type of cell that that neuron could be connected to would be like a muscle cell. And the connection between the neuron and the target cell is called a synapse. So... Um, this is basically a gap between the two, um, and these are triggered by neurotransmitters. And so you saw in that video about how neurons work, some of the gates on those neurons, um, on the axons and so forth, are triggered by what he called ligands. Those are chemicals that can attach to um, proteins and, and molecules on the membrane and send signals. And so that's what neurotransmitters do. Neurotransmitters are working to send signals, in this case, from one cell to another. So let's take a look at what we're talking about here. So there are two types here of neuro, uh, neurons connecting to another cell. So here we've got the neuron coming in. This is the end of the axon. So this is the terminal end and it's joining to its target cell. Now here, what we've got are channels that are directly connecting 
that neuron to its target cell. So they're directly connected, and in this case, they're using ions to change the potential. So those ions are going to flow back and forth to change the potential to send the signal to the target cell. So it works just the same sort of way as you saw with the, or the signal going down the axon. So that's one way, but a common one that we see is using these neurotransmitters. And so you can see over here where those neurotransmitters bind to the channel. And so it's just like what he was showing you in the video that some of these channels require these ligands, or in this case, it's specifically a neurotransmitter. They require a molecule to bind to them to open up. And so if you look down here in the picture with all of them, there are some of them that are closed because they don't have any uh, neurotransmitter connected to them. And so they'll stay closed until they get a neurotransmitter connected, and that will allow the ions to flow in to send the signal. Okay. So where do those neurotransmitters come from? They come from the neuron. So the neuron is going to actually produce these neurotransmitters, and those neurotransmitters are going to get sent when the action potential comes down through the neuron. So that action potential is going to trigger these vesicles, these packages of neurotransmitters, to travel to the axon terminal end and open up and release their little packages of neurotransmitters. Otherwise, these little vesicles just hang out in the end of the axon, in the terminal, and wait. But when that action potential comes in, that is going to say, okay, send the packages to the end and let them go. The more that action potential comes through, the more of these packages are going to get pushed to the end of the terminal and released. So more neurotransmitter is going to get fired out. These neurotransmitters will hold these uh, channels open, but not forever. So eventually these neurotransmitters pop off and need to be refreshed. So if the action potential stops, the neurotransmitters stop being released. And so the signal will stop because eventually these guys will lose their neurotransmitters and the channels will close the ions will stop flowing, and the signal will stop going to the target cell. Okay. So let's take a look at a neurotransmitter that we all actually know, um, and that's endorphins. So endorphins, these are a group of neurotransmitters that are released in times of pain or stress. So we are all very familiar with endorphins right now. In fact, we're kind of getting used to having <laughs> endorphins in our system. Um, and so we have our system release these to bind to receptors to decrease pain. So this is very often why you won't feel pain right after an injury, because these endorphins um, get released by your nerve cells and go out and bind to receptors to basically dampen down the reaction from your nerve cells that are in your pain receptors. Um, so that way you're not in as much pain. Um, so this is actually tied to some things that we enjoy. Um, this is associated with the runner's high. So if any of you are runners, um, you know, after you run for a certain amount of time, you kind of get to that point where you get that kind of energized kind of feeling. Um, and so that is um, tied to endorphins. This is why laughter actually can help um, if you are feeling um, either, well, pain, as long as it's not pain, you know, in an area that laughing is going to make worse. Um, but this is why things like laughing, eating chocolate, um, chili peppers for some people, and meditation all can help because um, these are all things that are actually going to help release endorphins. So um, laughing 
helps relieve, uh, uh, release endorphins. So that's going to help bind to receptors, um, decrease pain, help relieve stress. Uh, this is why some people like myself, we feel better after eating chocolate because chocolate um, is going to do the same sort of thing. Chili peppers, some people get a kind of high after eating chili peppers, things that are super, super spicy because it triggers the same reaction um, because that's a stress reaction. Your body is freaking out, but it releases those endorphins to dampen down that pain reaction. And then meditation can also um, help trigger this reaction. So the thing is, is that there are actually medications that will bind to the same receptor. So I'm guessing that you've all heard of at least one of these. Um, so morphine, codeine, opium, and heroin all bind to the same receptor that the endorphins bind to. Um, in fact, opium um, is what all of these are derived from. And there's a reason why they do this. So if we take a look, here is an endorphin and here is the binding site for an endorphin. So it is going to bind here to what we call the opiate um, receptor. This is the one that's gonna send that signal to decrease that pain, um, kind of try and calm us some, and that's what gives us all of these things that I was talking about, you know, associated with the runner's high and so forth. Um, so this is the guy that fits in this slot. And so it, if you've got endorphins in your system, it's going to fit in that slot. It's going to send the signal for this molecule to do its job. However, if you take a look here at morphine, take a look at this section right here. It's nearly identical to that section on endorphins. Um, the only difference is right here. We've got an oxygen instead of a hydrogen, but otherwise it is basically identical. And it's close enough that it fits in the slot because if you look here, this is the section right down here that fits in the slot for the receptor. And so that is the spot that is the identical spot on morphine. And so it fits in that receptor. And if you think about it, we use morphine to decrease pain. And in fact, that's what all of these end up, uh, end up doing. Uh, morphine, codeine, opium, heroin, they all end up suppressing pain. Um, that's actually what they were all developed for, is for pain management. The problem with them is they are addictive. Um, because if you think about it, these up here are also slightly addictive because they make us feel good. Um, and that is a difficult thing to break. Not only that, these drugs right here, because they work so well at fitting and firing this receptor, um, make it very difficult for someone to stop using uh, to get this reaction. You know, we will often will prescribe um, morphine and codeine for pain management after surgeries and so forth. Uh, however, if someone's on it for too long or is very susceptible to the medication as far as an addiction to it, um, it doesn't take long for them to become addicted to it. This is why this is one of the major problems that we have here in the United States as far as addiction now.